The game of college basketball has a grand history that combines legendary achievements of yesterday's pioneers with the dynamic feats of today's generation. In 2006, with over 100 years of college basketball history in the books, the NABC Foundation launched the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. While building its state-of-the-art college basketball experience in Kansas City, the first induction class was enshrined during a historic event described as the Mount Rushmore of college basketball. Since then, some of the game's greatest coaches, players, and contributors have been recognized with the ultimate honor, the prestigious Hall of Fame medal. Tonight, the NABC Foundation and Nike are proud to present the 15th induction class featuring a special tribute to three teams who helped define the rise of college basketball. The 1965-66 Texas Western Miners, college basketball's first team to win the national championship with an all-black starting lineup, paving the way for more widespread integration in the sport. The 1963-64 UCLA Bruins, a team that ignited the most remarkable dynasty in college basketball history and capturing the first of coach John Wooden's 10 national titles. The 1975-76 Indiana Hoosiers, a powerhouse team that swept to a perfect 32-0 record under coach Bob Knight and still stands as the nation's last NCAA Division I undefeated season. It's the class of 2020. And now, the host for the 15th annual enshrinement, college basketball analyst Andy Katz and Clark Kellogg. Welcome, everyone, to this unprecedented virtual National College Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I'm Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by my partner, Clark Kellogg from CBS Sports. And in an unprecedented year, we're doing this virtually, Clark. Yeah, thrilled to be joining you, Andy, for a special night for these teams that we'll honor and induct into the College Basketball Hall of Fame. You know you're right. COVID-19 has created various levels of challenge and frustration and loss and difficulty for all of us. Yet, this is a special night because even in the midst of what COVID-19 has wreaked on all of our lives, we still have opportunities and reasons to celebrate and to rejoice my in milestone achievements. And this is one of those nights. And I'll tell you, Clark, uh, college basketball certainly to me is maybe the most inclusive sport in our American landscape. And in a year where uh, there was an awakening uh, to obviously the injustice, the social injustice and the systemic racism, we've got, you know, historic teams and notably one team that we'll get to this evening uh, that certainly helped break down one of those barriers that we'll talk about momentarily. And so I think that this night, these teams are emblematic of the historic change that we've seen and the way in which college basketball can help that along. Boy, so well said. Amen and amen, Andy. I couldn't agree more. Man, you think about it. What sports, and we're talking basketball here, but sports in general has always been a bit of a launching pad for unity and for sacrifice, hard work, doing things together, and even overcoming some of the social ills that exist in our society. And we're honoring teams that were doing their work on the court in periods of time where we have similar situations to what we have today. So very fitting that we're looking at three iconic championship teams in the history of college basketball. And so, Clark, look, in the last 15 years of the National College Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony, um, there has been some incredible moments of just who was on stage. Yeah. Uh, think about the inaugural class in 2006. Um, you know, first of all, just the big names that obviously were honored that night. Uh, you had John Wooden, Dean Smith, Bill Russell, Oscar Robertson. Uh, what a class to start everything off. And then on stage in 2009, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson together. The class of 2014, which included Shaq, Grant Hill, Daryl Griffith. In 2017, John Stockton and Tim Duncan. So overall, over the last 15 years, it's been an amazing group of players, coaches, and contributors. Yeah, amazing may not even do it justice. I actually had the privilege of being part of all three of those particular enshrinement ceremonies that you referenced. And it's a special night 
not just for the players and the teams and the universities they represent, but for their family and friends and other supporters who share in the excitement and joy of the recognition that comes from being inducted into the College Basketball Hall of Fame. So let's get to our three teams. Um, unbelievable importance in the sport, and I would argue in the United States in terms of breaking down barriers. The 63-64 UCLA team, uh, arguably the team that started the UCLA dynasty, the Wizard of Westwood, the first of 10 national championships for John Wooden. And then, as I referenced earlier, the 1965-66 Texas Western Miners, the first time that an all-African-American starting five won the national championship, coached by the late Don Haskins. And then in 1975-76, Bob Knight led the Indiana Hoosiers to an undefeated season, the last team to win the national championship undefeated. It's kind of like the 72 Dolphins every year. Around March, early April, can another team do it? We'll see if it happens this year. Yeah, iconic teams, historic teams, championship teams, and not only championship teams, but championship coaches and people made up those teams. Really excited to be part of this induction ceremony of those three historically great college basketball teams. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a deep dive into the class of 2020 with individuals who were there who can certainly speak to what they experienced during those seasons. And let's start with the 1965-66 Texas Western Miners. Clark takes us there. Thank you very much, Andy. I was a real little fella back in 1966 when Texas Western was making pioneering history on the hardwood. I tell you what, I don't grow tired of learning more and more about this historic basketball team. Let's now take a look back at these pioneering round ballers who made history and changed college basketball forever. When it comes to defining the history of college basketball, possibly no other team paved the way for the game's future more than the 1965-66 Texas Western Miners. During an era of social unrest and racial discrimination in America, Hall of Fame coach Don Haskins assembled a team that did much more than win a national championship. They became the first college basketball team in history to win the NCAA crown with an all-black starting lineup. Facing widespread criticism and struggling with racial exclusion along the way, Texas Western boldly accepted the challenges off the court and focused on dominating their competition on the court. The Miners powered through the season with a 28-1 record, including a thrilling run through the NCAA tournament that featured two overtime wins to get to the Final Four. In the historic championship game against the all-white Kentucky Wildcats, Texas Western fought to a 72-65 victory and captured the nation's attention with their unforgettable achievement. The team's magical season opened doors for black players in the ensuing years and began changing the landscape of college basketball. The extraordinary accomplishment by Haskins and the Texas Western team became the storyline of the highly acclaimed film, Glory Road, released in 2006. And now, this remarkable team will forever be chronicled with their induction into the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. That rewind always does something to me, thinking about the history that was made by that outstanding basketball team of Texas Western and how they did it. I've often wondered what it was like to kind of journey through that kind of season and make the history that that team did. Well, I don't have to go too far to actually find out a little more about what that was like, as I'm proud and grateful to be joined by Neville Shedd, the tallest of those Texas Western round ballers, listed at 6'8", hell from the Bronx in New York, and found his way out to Texas Western back in the 60s, and he is here representing that championship team from 1966. Neville Shedd, great to have you with us. Congratulations on this, your team being honored by the College Basketball Hall of Fame, and um, thank you for being here. It's truly a great uh, time as our journey continues. 
And I'm so proud to be able to represent the men of Glory Road. Yeah, you know, talking about that particular team, one of the things I've often wondered, you know, history has a way of amplifying things, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a not so good way. What do you most recall about that season's journey? When did you guys know that you had a chance to win it all? Well, you got to first remember that we were just a bunch of kids, you know, trying to play the game, or shall I say one game at a time, not knowing that, you know, our, our great chance of becoming national championships were on our mind. One game at a time, staying focused, playing for a man who at that time we hated his, this gentleman, I'd like to call him other names, but uh, he focused on staying in charge of the game, you know, being the best that we can be, you know, one game at a time, not even thinking about how far we can go, particularly back that that time, you know, a little town in uh, West Texas, whereas so it wasn't a lot of TV. Remember, you didn't have the, the sports uh, channels and things like we have today. So when out there playing and playing for a man who had a tenacious way of, shall I say, getting a shape for the game seven days on the floor. We played uh, under his helm. Uh, we practiced until he got tired. There was no time to be playing around but just keeping focus on how and how far we can go if we're determined to make each game the best game of our lives. Yeah, you know, you talk about Coach Don Haskins, the late Don Haskins, and you know, what was it about him that made him such an outstanding coach? I know he was intense. I know he cared. But is there anything else that you could share that really helped you guys get to the place of being national champions? Well, you know, uh, can I also say that when we first met this gentleman, you know, I thought he was the greatest guy in the world. You know, coming from New York City to El Paso, Texas, you know, uh, Texas, nothing uh, that I, I ever thought it would be like. And this little chunky man came out on the airport. He reminded me of a Clint Eastwood movie, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. and he strictly was glad to see us. And we went directly to the basketball court. And that's when my life began to be, shall we say, a big part of history. But, you know, he was a man that stayed focused. And, you know, during that time, he did a great job of shielding us from the things that was going on in the arena of society. And he demanded certain things for us. He knew how to get the best out of his players from the time we hit that floor until the game was over. Such a great man. Hated him then, but we all love him to death right now. Yeah, You know, I want to go back to that season to the best that you can. Um, you guys had to win a couple of overtime games to ultimately get to that final game. Um, was there ever any doubt that you would be able to continue to advance in the tournament? And what were you guys feeling as you got to the tournament and then ended up in, in a couple of overtime games along that, along that road to the championship? Well, you know, uh, when you're on a road, you know, trying to make it to the playoffs or the final four, you know, there's sometimes you got to have a little luck. And uh, it was something that was very fortunate for us. But, you know, media is something that, you know, teams have today. We can network and find out who we're playing. Back then when someone said Kentucky or Duke or any of the teams, we didn't know anything about them. So we had to maintain the type of tenacious basketball that we played, an uh, overtime game. As uh, you know, for us, we had to play an extra game. Uh, I think it was Oklahoma City to get to the regionals. Then uh, playing that first game uh, against the University of Cincinnati, it was an overtime. That was a thriller. Then the next night, that was that was Kansas. And you're talking about Lady Luck on our side. That was a great game. Two overtimes. And... If you know the story and a lot of a text uh, co correction, Kansas people are saying that it was not correct when that great shooter, JoJo White, stepped on the line. And 
I must say, Mr. Rudy Marriage was right on point to make that great call that brought us to the second overtime. And, you know, thinking about not how hard we're going to be for that second game, we said, hey, let's continue to play just like we did to get to this point. The rest is history. Yeah, that certainly is the case. The rest is history and great history it is. What do you take most away from what you guys accomplished together back in 1966? What stands out and sticks with you as you've journeyed? I mean, that's been, shoot, that's 40, 50 plus years ago that that happened. And yet I'm sure there's some things that resonate you resonate with you from that, that particular season. You know, uh, the first thing, you know, we got to say, if you know, we got to say we had to stay focused and the dedication and hard work that all 12 of those athletes had to continue each day in playing with this man. And, you know, people ask us, well, you know, what about this team? How would you describe them in one word? I said cohesiveness. These were uh, men of colors, black, Hispanic, uh, Hispanic and white that lived together. Uh, shared the same blood, you know, we loved each other. We loved each other's Then We didn't have time to worry about what was going on in society back then. You know, it was the fact of how we had to play. We had to stay together. We had a goal. And remember, we were just young kids, you know, thinking about the journey ahead of us. And once again, I always got to say, hey, let's all look back at the history and see what we are going to through the day. If we can take a tablespoon of that cohesiveness that that team had yesterday, I think our word, little by little, would just be a little better than it is today. Agree 100% with that. It doesn't take much to change things if we're committed to doing it together. And sports is one of the great teachers of what cohesiveness and being together can mean. Did you guys feel any of that tension? You certainly had to the racial tension and the segregation but how much did you feel it and was Don Haskins somewhat of a buffer in that talk to me a little bit about what that felt like young kids nonetheless but African-American black Hispanic knowing there was racial tension around how did you guys experience that if you did and then how did you try to navigate it I have to laugh at that question. You know, we did not have time to think about what was going on in society during then. Now, you got to remember where we were in a little small town, uh, El Paso, Texas. Coach Haskins, once again, did a great job of shielding us from those things. You know, our lifestyle was eat, get up and go to class, go to the gym. Seven days a week, played until he got tired. We had a focus on just staying together so that we can survive just playing one game at a time. I believe, I really believe that if we'd have been thinking about doing that networking was not something that was involving us so much, but just the fact that, hey, playing the game of basketball, which we love, played as a team, knowing what victory is because it became because of hard work, staying together, and staying focused on what the job was for be for that day. Coach Hastings was a great man and trying to instill that in us that took us one game. He chose nothing but the best. Defense was our offense, and that's something that we took a lot of pride in. Thinking about what was going on out there, it was not on our minds. Thinking about winning, no, thinking about being successful and, and just thinking about what it took to play one game after another. Well, well said, Neville. And congratulations as you represent that historic team, champions, legends, Glory Road, Texas Western. Congratulations to all of you as members of the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Blandy, you heard it. How about that? Never get tired of hearing about that story of Texas Western and Glory Road. But, you know, a few years earlier, there were big things brewing at UCLA. I'm going to let you introduce us to our next team. 
Well, thanks, Clark. Look, there is always a beginning. And the beginning of the UCLA dynasty, the Wizard of Westwood, it began in 1963-64 with the national championship UCLA Bruins. That's the first of 10 titles for John Wooden. Ultimately, the beginning, if you will, of what later would become an 88-game win streak. John Wooden's career at UCLA, iconic, historic, but a lot of it goes back to that 63-64 team. There wasn't a lot of size. They had to change the way they would defend, which we'll get to momentarily. And really, it transcends what happened then, decades later, to what's going on today, the way teams play the way they handle that bullseye on their back if they're undefeated. There are so many parallels that began in 63-64 that we can trace all the way to today's game. So let's go back and look back to 1963-64 and see how this amazing team shaped the future of the greatest dynasty that college basketball has ever seen. You would argue that UCLA under coach John Wooden in the 1960s and 70s is the most heralded dynasty college basketball has ever seen. All legends have to start somewhere, and the upward trajectory of UCLA basketball and Wooden's historic career began with the 1963-64 team. The Bruins entered that season, Wooden's 16th at UCLA with lots of talent yet weren't considered among the country's top teams. The tallest player was 6'5", inspiring assistant coach Jerry Norman to devise the zone press defense that would become a staple of Wooden's teams. Revolutionary at the time, the disruptive tactics sped up the pace of the game and forced turnovers. The smaller, quick Bruins did just that. They were led by talented guards Walt Hazard, the National Player of the Year, and Gail Goodrich, a prolific shooter and playmaker. The two combined to average over 40 points per game while showcasing this new brand of basketball. UCLA streaked to a perfect 26-0 record during their regular season and then beat Seattle, San Francisco, and Kansas State on the way to the national title game versus Duke. The Bruins behind 27 points from Goodrich and 26 from sophomore Kenny Washington leveraged a 16-0 first-half run to defeat the Blue Devils, 98-83, for the championship. The record books show that the 1963-64 UCLA team posted an undefeated 30-0 record and hoisted a trophy. But in the larger scope of history, this resilient team played an even greater role. They ignited the beginning of an unprecedented era that would see 10 national championships between 1964 and 1975. That is a Hall of Fame achievement. Well, that was a remarkable look. It's certainly an iconic team, one that is so deserving of this honor of being inducted into the National College Basketball Hall of Fame. And uh, it's an honor to be joined by two members of that team, one player one assistant coach, uh, Gail Goodrich, a Hall of Famer in every sense of the word, uh, was easily uh, with the late Walt Hazard, um, you know, two of the most important players, not the only ones, but two of the most important players um, on that squad. Uh, And then Jerry Norman, the assistant coach to John Wooden, uh, who is uh, known then and now for uh, pushing Coach Wooden to uh, to put in a zone press um, that certainly has been used uh, many times since. Um, and so I want to get to both of you here to discuss this team. And and first, um, I want to deal with just, you know, we're so removed from it. Well, yeah, I want to start with you about when you look back at the importance of this team on the sport and how we are seeing it transcend today. How do you view it? Well, our team, and we were a team. Uh, We were a special team. Um, We played together. Uh, I am uh, really proud to be part of that team. You mentioned that Walt and I were uh, at the guard position and very instrumental. 
But there were other players as well. Fred Slaughter at the center position, Keith Erickson um, at the uh, forward, and Jack Hirsch also at the forward position. Um, and as I look back, you know, basketball is a game of quickness. It's a game of movement. And that's what we did. Uh, you know, we introduced the zone press. Uh, that was Jerry Norman's idea, of course. Uh, and we took advantage of our quickness and our speed to overcome a height uh, disadvantage. Um, we wanted to um, increase the pace of the game. We wanted to create tempo. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, so, uh, you know, it was just a great, great experience. We had won a few games early in the season and uh, we gained a lot of confidence. And when we took the floor, we expected to win. We had a lot of confidence uh, in our play, uh, probably bordering on a little bit of uh, cockiness, but uh, we were very competitive and really we thought we were going to win. So, Jerry, uh, before I dive deeper into uh, a little bit more uh, of the details of the squad, what, what are your fondest memories of coaching this team? Well, uh, fortunately, we had a lot of really great players. And if you put them in the right format, which we needed, we didn't have size, but we had talented players. And it's like everything else in life. If you have the right people, you usually get a pretty good result. So uh, it fit very well for the talent that we had. And looking back, uh, like Gail said, we were very confident in most of the games. And uh, I can remember playing in the, in the Nationals, all the coaches' conventions there at that time. And friends of mine would come down on the floor when we were, had a day to, before the game, you get an hour to, to run on, you know, warm up on the floor and get used to the, the environment and all that. And they say, how did you guys get here? Uh, we saw the other three teams that all, all out here today before you, you know, all they thought about was height. And uh, so I said, well, I don't know. I, I can tell you a couple of things. One is we've already beaten two of the teams that are already here. And I said, we haven't played the third one yet. So you're just going to have to wait and watch us play. So it was, a, it was a, a enjoyable experience to sit there in the national championship final game and watch these guys play. I mean, I really love watching them play because they were just phenomenal as a team. Yeah. You know, first of all, it's crazy. I think um, today's modern day fan, um, when they think UCLA in the, in the sixties and the seventies, um, they forget there was a time before Ralph Linder and Bill Walton when UCLA did not have the best big man in the country. So I, I want to go back to Gary on, on the topic of, Changing, um, you know, the way you guys defended the point of that um, as to why you needed to do that. How did you approach Coach Wooden? Look, this is what we need to do to win. Well, I told him that uh, you know we've got a lot of talented players, and uh, if we can force the other teams to play all over the court instead of letting them walk the ball up the floor, which is what we were doing early on or the couple of years before I was there. And if we could spread the court, height doesn't mean anything. And uh, so the other teams helped us also because there wasn't a lot of strategy in those days. When we when we started this defense in, in the early – and it went all the way through the season, the coaches – most of the coaches thought we were out there to steal the ball. So they, they, were, they weren't – they got kind of fooled by uh, – they didn't look at the fact that we were averaging 88 points a game. Well, how do we do that? You, know, you can't do that unless you can force the other team to play a higher tempo. And that was the whole objective was to uh, to force them to bring the ball up in such a way that they had to pass it down the floor. Anytime you have to pass it, it's, it increases the tempo. So as Gail mentioned earlier, uh, forcing the tempo of the game was a was a major factor. Gail, how receptive were the players to this adjustment? Well, we were very uh, receptive. Um, as Coach said, we had a lot of quickness. Uh, we were quicker than everybody else. Um, we were faster than everybody else. And with the zone press, um, we were able to really speed up the, the game and play a 94-foot game as opposed to a 47-foot game. So um, it opened it up. 
Um, we've got uh, a lot of uh, rather easy or cheap baskets. We didn't necessarily steal the ball all the time, but we had that pressure. And uh, we really went after it. You know, I watched the game today and, you know, they're token pressures, they're token three-quarter press zones or whatever, and they back off and they let the team, uh, you know, come up. And now with the, they have the 24-second clock, which we didn't have at that point. Um, so teams really could hold the ball. Now they, they can as much. But we really went after the press. Um, you know, we knew uh, there are certain angles to play. Uh, we forced certain places in the court where we would double team um, and then rotate. Uh, and we had a rim protector in Keith Erickson in the back line. Um, so uh, and we had uh, Fred Slaughter up front, our center, who was, uh, you know, 6'5", but way 240. Uh, can run the 199. So uh, we, uh, you know, we, they, so when they, they could not f- throw the ball over, but they had to uh, move into certain spots. And um, like I said, we, uh, we created that tempo, that fast pace. And I remember one game, uh, I think it was against Stanford, where we scored 11 straight points uh, in a minute uh, and the game was over. We just exploded. We were a very explosive, explosive team. And I think uh, one other thing about our team is that when we would get them to turn the ball over, we would able to, we were able to really capitalize and turn our defense into instant offense. Um, you know, we had a, a team the following year, um, and we we didn't have Walt Hazard, of course, and um, you know Walt really was a one of the best passers in the in the history of college basketball. Um, so we could turn get the ball turned over. And we could then convert. Um, and um, that is another big factor. Uh, you know, when you, when you get a team that is pressured or out of position defensively, you get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, really high percentage shots. And I think that's what we did. Jerry, uh, as Dale was saying, uh, going into every game, as the wins piled up, the players really felt like we're going to win every game. We're confident. But from the coaching staff side, how much pressure started to build as everyone was going after you guys, as, as you know, as the win total creeped up higher and higher, and the undefeated season became a thing, how, how much did that pressure start to get into the staff? I, I don't think it bothered us much. We are we were uh, pretty confident what we could do. We had you know great players, and if you got, as Gail said, we got quickness. If you put them in the right setting. And in in addition to that, the uh, other team's coaches uh, kind of fell into the way we wanted to play. They were worried about that we're going out there trying to steal the ball from them all the time. That wasn't our our major objective. And since they didn't recognize that, we end up being able to force almost every team we played to play the way we wanted to play. And uh, all they would do is come away and we'd, you know, we, we just scored a lot more points than everybody else just because... We were able to make them play the way we would and our players fit into the system. You know, and and exact, as Gail said, we had uh, all five players were factors in the defense and they were, uh, you know, all position great. As as Gail said, Keith played the back half of the court and it turned out we didn't know that at the start, but Keith was a phenomenal athlete and he was, he was, he could cover the entire back half of the court, which, which, enabled us to put a lot more pressure on them, even up, you know, further down the court. So uh, it just evolved. We got better at it. We got more confident. And uh, a lot of teams kept thinking they were going to beat us just because we didn't have any size. And, uh, and, and they probably misjudged most of the time of how to really play against us. Well, Gal, I just want to give you the final word here really quickly. Just um, that feeling when you won the championship um, and ultimately it became the first and um, all these years later. Well, that first championship was a uh, was very gratifying. I remember we cut down the nets and it was a, a culmination of a uh, goal and an objective that we had for the season. Um, I remember watching the uh, championship game the year before between uh, Lyle of Chicago and uh, Cincinnati. And uh, you know, I watched that game and we had everybody back coming the following year, coming back in 63 and 64. And I said, well, next year, I think we can play in that game. 
And I think every player who suits up at the beginning of the year looks at the realistic goals or objectives they have. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, only one team is standing. So um, it was really gratifying uh, to win that game. Uh, again, um, when you look back, I think we were a real team. And uh, that's what mattered. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you're a team and you accomplish uh, something, uh, you, you really uh, it can be happy at, at together. And we were a team that was really together uh, on that court. Uh, so uh, it was a great experience. I look back, great memory, um, and I'm very blessed to be part of it. Well, congratulations, Gail Goodrich, Jerry Norman, and to the entire 1963-64 UCLA team, which is now in, uh, inducted into the National College Basketball Hall of Fame. All right, up next, let's go to Clark Kellogg, who earlier caught up with Quinn Buckner as we speed ahead a decade to another undefeated team, the 1976 Indiana Hoosiers. Thank you, Andy. You know, I was a young buck when that Indiana team went unblemished to win the national title back in 1976. And I recall that team not having any weaknesses at all. Extremely balanced, extremely tough, and obviously extremely successful. Let's roll the video going back to 1975-76 and take a look at the last unbeaten national champion. In the highly competitive world of sports, perfection is rare. Entering the 1975-76 college basketball season, Indiana fifth-year coach Bob Knight told his players they were not only good enough to be NCAA champions, but they should aspire for an undefeated season. It wouldn't take long to test that goal. The Hoosiers faced the reigning national champs, the UCLA Bruins, in the season opener. Behind brilliant performances by All-Americans Scott May and Kent Benson, the Hoosiers exploded to a 20-point win and put an exclamation mark on their preseason number one ranking. Indiana excelled in nearly every phase of the game that season, outscoring opponents by an average of 17 points per game. They featured a productive offense that shot over 50% from the field and a relentless defense that forced an average of 20 turnovers per game. Powering through the regular season unbeaten, Indiana continued its dominance in the NCAA tournament. The Hoosiers faced a daunting bracket and would have to beat four top 10 opponents in a row to achieve perfection. A second win over UCLA in the final four semifinals set the stage for a showdown against Big Ten rival Michigan for the title. Three-year captain Quinn Buckner, along with the unstoppable Mae Benson tandem, ignited Indiana to an 86-68 victory and the trophy. Perfection indeed. In the 45 years since that season, no NCAA Division I team has gone undefeated. That amazing feat and the dominating way they achieved it is why the 1975-76 Indiana Hoosiers are regarded by many as the greatest single season team in the history of college basketball. Well, now it is time for me to have the opportunity to talk to a dear friend and one of the key members of that 1976 undefeated Indiana Hoosiers championship team and Quinn Buckner. He was a three-year captain and a four-year starter for Coach Bob Knight. He's also one of only a handful of guys that have won a, an NCAA championship, an NBA championship, an Olympic gold medal, and I think – he may have also won a high school championship, but I'll give him a chance to clarify that particular <laughs> fact. Story. But join me in welcoming Quinn Buckner. Quinn, great to see you, my friend, and thanks for carving out some time. Congratulations on representing this great team in the history of college basketball. Um, you know, I um, heard a quote from Bobby Knight not too long ago that indicated he set the goal for that team not only to win the Big Ten, not only to win the national championship, but to go undefeated in doing so. And that blew me away. Was that actually the case? 
Well, first of all, it's it, any time I can be with you, it's a pleasure. You, you're you're one of the great human beings I've ever been around, and and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Uh, and by the way, Appreciate my it. high school teammates would want me to make sure that that, in fact, was recognized, the fact that we did win two high school championships. But to your question, uh, what Coach Knight said effectively was, um, based on the year prior, we only had lost one game. If we would do what we had been doing throughout the uh, previous year and, and listen to him, he said it this way. And then he, he always termed things in a real interesting way. He said, there, there won't be anybody that really has a chance to beat you if you do it that way. We'd had, you know, we were, listen, we had seniors. Um, we had seniors. They were smart. Uh, you, you nailed it. Uh, tough. Um, and, and, and knew what their roles were. There was a clear mission of what we were trying to get accomplished. And we were not, we were determined to try to do that. You know, as a senior, you know, this is your last shot. So whatever motivation you had as a junior, it's one thing when you're a senior, you know, this is it. So it was, uh, and we were a team full of seniors, if you will, with the exception of Benny as starters. So we were, mentally prepared to do what we had to do. And, and thankfully we were able to do it, but coach Knight, as he was about many things was on point. Yeah. He was often, often on point. You mentioned that team the year before the 74, 75 team. Talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that team in terms of how close it was to winning a championship. Well, we, we look at it as if you will, the 75 team being, it was the best team I played on, quite frankly. Uh, Scott May, probably about three weeks before, I want to say three to four weeks before, had his um, left arm broken. And he was, our, Scott was our best player. And so we had to go to the tournament. We got ourselves, we were doing pretty well, got ourselves into the tournament, obviously, and we were playing. And by that time, Scott hadn't fully been able to get himself healthy. And we had played Kentucky during the early part of the season and had beat them um, let's just say rather handedly. And and when we played them in Dayton, Ohio, um, to go really to get to the Final Four, uh, they beat us. They, you're talking about motivation. They had great motivation because we had played so well the time we'd beaten them. Scott was not fully healthy, and, and we didn't carry the load. And Frank, Kentucky beat us. And, and that's a big part of why we, I thought we were much more effective. But without our best player being fully healthy, he came back and played. But Scott wasn't healthy, and Scott was our best player. Yeah, you know, championship teams often work through adversity. It sounds like your adversity, your team's adversity, was that season platforming and launching you into the 75-76 season. But were there any types of distraction or distractions or friction as you guys <laughs> journeyed through that 75, 76 season. I know you were all mature and you were all seniors and been together for a while, but typically mm. within a household or a family, mm. there's some type of friction or dissension at some point. Did that exist with you guys at all? Hey, Clark, I played for Coach Knight. He doesn't have dissension. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know better than I do. The, the, the culture that he established was one that there was anything. He wanted all of the the attention direction attention kind of gives the wrong slant or to that what he wanted it to be was be united and um at times he would do things that would have the entire team um let's just say less than happy with him or you know there are other words you can use for that but that was in a way it, it's just weird how it, it, it galvanized the, the unit but i also have to to be mindful of the fact truthfully about uh, those kind of the things as you talked about with adversity one of the things that was an adverse circumstance uh, the blessings that our freshman class had we went to the final four as freshmen and ended up losing in the third in, in the semifinals to ucla so now you you start stacking on experiences and, and understanding the kinds of things you need to do in preparation to get to the 76 team and know that you don't have any any chance to take anything for granted. But to your point, there's normally some adversity. Coach Knight kept the uh, media basically away from us. So you and I, as it were, could not get there very often. Very few people in practice, which is a big part of how people like to operate. Um, and, and even he had his special, if you will, uh, administrators and the president, John Ryan, 
obviously was involved and would come to practice. But to my point, Coach Knight managed the entire environment because of your exact point. He wanted as little distractions as possible because he understood, again, what he had much more so than any of, of the players did. So uh, he managed that situation masterfully. Well, anytime a team wins a championship and you guys did it undefeatedly, uh, there are games that stick out in any season. Were there any games particularly? Let's go. Well, UCLA, you guys met them multiple times during your career. The opening game of the right. season, if I recall, was against UCLA, and you guys basically drummed them. Talk a little bit about that game, if you can recall <laughs> what stood out to you now. Well, what I recall was the year we lost to Kentucky, the previous year, Coach Knight at some point had come to Scott and I and said, we have a chance to play UCLA on a neutral site. And before he could get it out of his mouth, as competitive as we are, or we are and I'm still competitive, we said, yes, let's do that. And, and that was important in a lot of ways because uh, UCLA had been the dominant team. And UCLA was the team that we uh, – that now it's a junior class, but when we were freshmen at the Final Four that we had seen with Coach Wooden, we played a close game, lost that, and thought we had a real shot to win that one. So when this opportunity came, I personally wasn't looking – I wasn't passing it up because that was the, the standard. So we play them, and we do. We beat them handedly. Um, and it was one of the things, frankly, uh, when I think about it, when we played them again in the semifinals uh, uh, at the tournament, uh, I remembered a great player, Richard Washington. They had Marcus Johnson, who's a terrific player, Richard Washington. Those two I remember, particularly Richard, who said that was an exhibition game, the game that we had beaten them. And um, my nature is not to talk. My nature is to show, do what we do. But I, I, I made that a, a, a very pointed thought that, okay, if that was the, the exhibition game, this first game in the uh, finals round is real. Let's see what you have. And our team played exceptionally well, and we, we were able to beat them there. That's, that's really what we were made of. We, 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 we were very competitive. We're very mild-mannered, if you will, off the court. But on the court, we're a very competitive group. Yeah. What do you take most away from that championship season? Obviously, you had four terrific years at Indiana and played with some outstanding men and players. But as you look back, as we kind of wind down our time together here, what do you most take away from that championship and that that time <laughs> for Quinn Buckman? Well, there are a couple of things. Um, Coach Knight had said on our senior night that and told the crowd, take a look at this group because you'll never see another one like it again. And and for many people, that, in fact, is the case. It's been a long time since since, you know, since then, quite frankly, uh, my teammates were very bright, very bright. And it makes a huge difference when you get in a game, Clark, as you know, where whatever the X and O is, is on that board and not moving. When all of a sudden you're on the floor and everybody has to all of a sudden improvise and you can you do it so often that you improvise the same thing at the same time. That was terrific from a group dynamic standpoint. And and always in these instances are the lifelong relationships that are developed, the bond that is de developed. It, it is a it is purely from a, some from a sports standpoint, but it's a love of one another. Regardless of where you were from, under these circumstances, you stood up, they stood up for you, you stood up for them. Those are the things that you take with you. So you know, um, first of all, that you can do some things that you may not have thought you could do, but you got some brothers that did it with you, and you can count on people. It, it, is, it is that. But lastly, and should be considered the top, we played for one of the great coaches in the history of coaching and not just basketball. And I've been blessed as you to be involved with this since I was very young. He was extraordinarily bright. He was a guy who you may say was maniacal about things, but it was about the details of being successful and, and making sure that your preparation for that success was paramount to anything you did. And you take that preparation, you carry that thought process through life, you have a chance to be successful. That's what I take from that, Clark. Wow. Well said, Quinn. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Coach Knight is a Naismith Hall of Famer. You, in fact, are a college basketball Hall of Famer, and now you're 75-76 team. 
is in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Well-deserving. Not sure if we'll ever see another team go unbeaten and get the crown, but time will tell. Thanks a lot for being here. Really appreciate it. And congratulations to you and your teammates. Thank you very much on behalf of my teammates, because this, this is huge for a lot of them for a variety of reasons. But thanks for you to you and all of who considered our team, because there are a lot of great teams out there. I'm also a huge Bill Russell fan, and I know Russ did this a couple of times. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> well said, well said. Well, with that, we're going to continue with our induction ceremony, and I'd like to welcome back my partner, Andy Katz. Well, Clark, the last time we saw an undefeated team win the national championship was that 75-76 Indiana Hoosiers team. Uh, and we got close in 2015 with Kentucky. They went into the Final Four undefeated. They lost to Wisconsin. What are the chances we could see another undefeated national champ? I think it'll ultimately happen, but I don't know if it'll be really soon. That's a really tall mountain to climb. Although there are a couple of teams on the horizon that look like they might have a chance in 2021. All right, so now let's look back again to these three historical teams and to a noted college basketball historian, a Hall of Famer in the Sports Writers Hall of Fame and the foremost expert on the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame Selection Committee, Dick Hoops Weiss. I've had the pleasure of being courtside with Hoops uh, throughout the last 30 years, yes. Uh, and Hoops, uh, I want to get your perspective on these three iconic teams. Yeah, UCLA coach John Wooden gets most of the credit uh, for coaching uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton when UCLA was in the midst of a 10 national championship run. 1964 was his first national championship, and he was able to show that he could win both big and small. UCLA uh, had a small, gifted team. Its biggest player was 6'5", but they chewed people up with a controlled fast break and a zone press that very few people had seen in the country. And it ended up speeding games up to a point where they scored 98 points against Duke in the NCAA final. Yeah, Texas Western was a, sociologi was a sociologist dream. This is a team that uh, uh, really showed that you can win a national championship starting five black players. Don Haskins played for uh, Mr. Ibit, Texas at Oklahoma A&M, was a great fundamental coach and recruited eight black players to the uh, to Western uh, Texas and built a national power, surprised everybody by uh, beating a lot of blue bloods along the way uh, and ended up really initiating the downfall of segregation in college basketball when his all-black team defeated an all-white team from Kentucky uh, in what some people still refer to as Brown versus the Board of Education on the college basketball court. Indiana was the closest thing I've seen to the perfect team. You had five players uh, who ended up playing in the NBA, including three All-Americans, Scott Mayquin Buckner and Kent Benson, for a coach who had a brilliant IQ and really was a slave to the idea that basketball still had a purest aspect to, uh, to it. Uh, Bob Knight was not only a brilliant mind, but he got players to play with the type of mental toughness that made them almost invincible in the basketball court. And he created a situation where his team finished 32 and up. You know, Dick, all of those coaches are Hall of Fame coaches. I'm wondering from your perspective, if in fact there was a common thread that you saw in each of them. Oh, I think that they still were teacher coaches, Clark. I think they still believed in the fundamental aspects of the game. I mean, wouldn't it have been on the coast for 14 years before he won his first uh, national championship. He played for Piggy Lambert at uh, at Purdue and brought that controlled fast break with him to the West Coast. I mean, and, and really changed the way the game was played. Uh, the best coaches on the West Coast before him were probably Phil Wolpert of uh, uh, San Francisco and Pete Noel from Cal. They played a much more patient slower style of play. 
uh, John Wooden came in and was able to force tempo with, with with his press and was able to use the athletes on his team to score a lot of points in March. Uh, Haskins was kind of the same way. I, I, I always believe that you – can mold a team to your way of thinking if you are a fundamentally sound coach. He was tough on his kids, but they learned how to play the right way, and it helped them get through some difficult times in the middle of the civil rights struggle. He had a, it wasn't just like winning a national championship. I mean, they had to endure death threats. They had to endure uh, uh, a lot of racist attitudes whenever they played on the road. And these kids were like, like like the kids at Indiana were mentally tough. As far as Knight is concerned, I think he was the the best coach in the post wooden era from the mid seventies to the mid eighties. Won three national championships, and his teams always played beautiful basketball. Nick, I could listen to you all day, give us um, those historical perspectives. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. It's now time to. Give it back to my partner, Andy Katz, for the unveiling of this um, great class. And now it's time for the official unveiling of the class of 2020 at the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in Kansas City. The legendary names that are comprised of all the classes are enshrined in a special place in a 40,000-foot interactive facility in Kansas City called the College Basketball Experience. And here is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame, Kevin Henderson. Welcome inside the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame, the hollow ground of our highly acclaimed college basketball experience in Kansas City. This is where the legends live, starting with a historic night in 2006, the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame has inducted some of college basketball's most iconic players, coaches, and contributors to be enshrined within its walls forever. Each year's class has been very special. We've inducted giants of the game who needed no introduction, and we've inducted innovative minds who have changed the game behind the scenes. We are proud of how this Hall of Fame has developed into the most prestigious honor in the game of men's college basketball. Tonight, we are pleased to officially welcome the class of 2020, three amazing teams that stand tall in the history of our game. They are more than a collection of individual players. They blended together to form three of the greatest teams ever. And now they enter college basketball immortality. It's our honor to welcome the 1963-64 UCLA Bruins, the 1965-66 Texas Western Miners, and the 1975-76 Indiana Hoosiers into the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. Their national championship seasons were unlike anything our great sport has ever witnessed, and we're honored to celebrate their accomplishments and lasting legacy within the game. Congratulations to all of the class of 2020. Clark, I'm a student of history, and I love hearing the oral history of anyone who was involved in historic moments. And uh, as we all advance in age, uh, I love just hearing from those who actually experienced it, whether they were a player, a coach, or a contributor. Yeah, you know, Andy, there's something special about not only reading and hearing words, but to your point, hearing them from the people who actually lived those moments. And we've been privileged and blessed to have been able to talk to some of the members of those teams that were enshrined here tonight. So a big thank you to the NABC Foundation, the Selection Committee, and all of those involved in this great event. Yeah, and it is a phenomenal event. 
again, I've had a privilege, had the privilege of being part of several enshrinement ceremonies, and they always leave me feeling so good, thankful, and grateful to be part of the great game of college basketball. And speaking of the selection committee, I've also been part of that committee that selects those who will be enshrined into the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. And the class of 2021 is outstanding. Anxious to get that particular event, hopefully in 2021, done in person. But let's take a look at the 2021 National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame class. David Greenwood, UCLA. Hersey Hawkins, Bradley. Jim Jackson, the Ohio State University. Antoine Jamison, North Carolina. Paul Pierce, Kansas. The late Lynn Bias, Maryland. Coaches Rick Bird and Tom Penders. Rick Bird, Belmont. Tom Penders, multiple stops in his Hall of Fame coaching career. So another great class coming into the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in 2021. Well, Clark, this was an incredible honor to share this virtual stage with you. I hope that uh, we can do this again in person, as you said, in, in 2021. Um, in, uh, Big thank you to everyone that was watching uh, this night to honor these three iconic teams in this, the 15th edition of the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And we want to remind everyone that you can always donate and help continue the celebrations of these teams and players and coaches and stakeholders in this incredible game uh, that we all love. And so, to everyone, we bid good night. We hope to see you soon in person. Stay safe.